Welcome to Daily News Simplified. Here we take up important news articles from the Delhi edition of the Hindu. The news articles are important from the UPSC examination perspective and other competitive examination. The topics for today's discussion are displayed on your screen. Before the discussion, there is an announcement. As we know, choosing optional is the most critical decision that we make in our UPSC journey. Optional is a ranked decider and hence it is necessary that we make an informed choice. In this regard, Rao's IAS optional faculties are conducting open house sessions of various optional subjects. You can attend these sessions to experience the excellence of their knowledge and their pedagogy. The link for the same is given in the description. The first topic of today's session is important from General Studies Paper 3 perspective, Environmental Pollution and degradation. Recently, National Green Tribunal criticized the Madhya Pradesh government for the significant damage to water bodies and issued an order to seize the operation of cruise vessels and other motor-powered boats in Bhoj wetland. The directive was issued by Central Zone Bench of the Environmental Court in response to an application filed last year that has expressed concern about the deterioration of the wetland encompassing the upper lake and lower lake. In prelims 2022 and 2019, questions appeared on similar lines. The answer for these questions will be given in the end of the discussion of this topic. In 2018, question appeared in mains, what is wetland? Explain the Ramsar concept of wise use in the context of wetland conservation. Cite two examples of Ramsar sites from India. First, let us see some of the facts relating to Bhoj wetland. It is located in Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh and the wetland comprises two interconnected man-made lakes in India. The upper lake is one of the oldest and most expansive lakes in central India and was created by King Bhoja in the 11th century. The king constructed an earthen dam across the Kolans river. The Bhoj wetland in the year 2002 was recognized as wetland of global importance under the Ramsar under the Ramsar Convention of 1971. Currently, the wetland is facing certain challenges and the challenges we are going to discuss are more or less similar for other wetlands in India. As per the study conducted by Environmental Planning and Coordination Organization, the Bhoj wetland confronts a dual challenge of deteriorating water quality and reduced storage capacity. On the urban front, Water quality degradation results from inflow of sewage, nutrients and toxins originating from catchment areas. The upper lake in particular contends with a daily influx of approximately 9.82 million gallons of the sewage. The majority of the catchment area is rural, which is primarily devoted to agriculture where intensive chemical farming practices are common and it leads to utilization of chemical fertilizers and pesticides which subsequently seep into the lake via streams. The southwest region bears the brunt of this agricultural runoff, thus adversely affecting water quality and posing a long-term threat to the wetlands health. Also, a significant volume of silt flows into the lake from the rural catchment area, further enhancing the conservation challenges faced by the Bhoj wetland. As per the study conducted by Worldwide Fund for Nature India report, among all the ecosystems in India, wetlands are facing some of the most severe threats. These critical habitats are grappling with a range of challenges, including loss of vegetation, salinization, excessive inundation, water pollution, invasive species, and unchecked development and road construction. The wetland ecosystems hold a unique position as transitional zones bridging the divide between terrestrial and aquatic environments. They are referred as ecotones highlighting their role in connecting the two distinct ecological drains. Now let us understand the wetlands through Ramsar Convention definitions. The Ramsar Convention on wetlands offers a comprehensive definition of wetlands encompassing various key characteristics such as marshes, fence and the peatlands. These areas may occur naturally or with artificial interventions. The wetlands can exhibit either temporary or permanent characteristics and these include a spectrum of water types such as freshwater, 
brackish water and salt water environments and the depth of of marine water within wetlands at low tide does not surpass a height of 6 meters distinguishing from deeper aquatic ecosystems next we will be seeing some of the facts related to ramsar convention ramsar convention is the sole global treaty exclusively dedicated to the preservation of a single ecosystem that is wetlands and this important convention was established on february 2nd 1971 which was initiated by united nations educational scientific and cultural organization and it officially came into effect in 1975 with the countries around the world recognizing the significance of safeguarding their wetland ecosystems india signed the ramsar convention on february 1 1982 thus solidifying its dedication to the global cause presently there are 75 ramsar sites in india marking the significance of this date february 2nd is celebrated as world wetlands day to raise awareness about the importance of wetlands there are three pillars important under the ramsar convention these are wise use this is central to the ramsar convention and this principle advocates for sustainable utilization of wetlands balancing human needs with the preservation of ecological integrity the next pillar of the convention is list of wetlands of international importance the governments commit to this list designating specific wetlands for international recognition and protection the inclusion of such wetlands signifies government's pledge to take measures to uphold the ecological character of these sites the next pillar is international cooperation as collaboration between nations is a fundamental aspect which emphasizes the importance of working together to conserve wetlands on a global scale another important aspect related to ramsar convention is montreal's record the montreal's record serves as a register of wetland sites within the list of wetlands of international importance these sites have either undergone are undergoing or are anticipated to experience changes in their ecological character due to factors like technological advancements pollution or human interference montreal's record was adopted in brisbane during the conference of contracting parties in 1996 and the database plays a pivotal role within the ramsar convention by continuously monitoring and documenting changes in designated wetland sites thus ensuring their protection two prominent montreal record sites in india include lokta lake in the state of manipur and kyoladyor national park in the state of rajasthan Chilika Lake another significant Indian wetland was added to Montreal's record in the year 1993 but later it was removed from the list in 2002 the Ramsar convention collaborates closely with six distinguished organizations which are known as international organization partners and these six IOPs are BirdLife International International Union for Conservation of Nature the international water management institute wetlands international worldwide fund for the nature and international wildfowl and wetlands trust also within the ramsar convention there are nine criteria given for identifying wetlands of international importance and out of this nine criteria one must be fulfilled to be designated as ramsar site the list of nine criteria are given in pdf and a word document here we will be seeing for important criteria if the site supports vulnerable endangered or critically endangered species or threatened ecological communities if it regularly supports 20000 or more water birds or if it regularly supports 1% of individuals in a population of one species or subspecies of water bird or if it regularly supports 1% of the individuals in a population of one species or subspecies of wetland dependent non avian animal species here in this map you will be finding all the 75 ramsar sites in india you can take a screenshot of this map 
Also, this map has been provided in the PDF and Word document. After a discussion of important aspects and provisions related to Ramsar Convention, now let us move on to see regulation of wetlands in India by the Indian government, that is, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. We will be seeing some of the basics related to the regulations, and these are important from UPSC perspective. The Wetlands Conservation and Management Rules 2017 have been officially promulgated by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, and this is in accordance with the provisions of Environment Protection Act of 1986. These rules have been introduced for effective conservation and management of wetlands within India. They represent a substantial update, supplanting the earlier. Wetlands Conservation and Management Rules from 2010. The 2017 rule also serves as the principal regulatory framework for governing the conservation and management of wetlands within the country. These rules have ushered in a shift in wetland management that is deviating from centralized approach towards increased involvement of state level organizations. The 2017 rules have given key responsibilities to. National Wetland Committee in overseeing the integrated management of Ramsar Convention areas and providing guidance to state agencies on the concept of wise use concerning the wetlands, and to aid state governments and the union territory administrations in implementing these rules. Comprehensive guidelines have been developed. These guidelines encompass various aspects, including identification and delineation of wetlands. creation of list of regulated and permitted activities and the structure and operational matters concerning the wetlands authority moving on let us see some of the salient features related to wetlands conservation and management rules 2017 these rules mandate the establishment of state wetland authority in each state and union territory presided over by state's environment minister The authority will comprise diverse government representatives with expertise in fields such as hydrology, socio-economics, landscape design, etc. These rules have also introduced the concept of smart use as the guiding principle of wetland management. With this rule, the shift towards sustainable use acceptable to conservation objectives is termed wise use, marking a decentralization of powers. The state wetland authorities are tasked with creating exhaustive list of activities to be regulated and permitted within notified wetlands and their zones of influence. They are also authorized to add activities that should be prohibited in specific wetlands and develop plans for more efficient wetland utilization. Under the 2017 rules, the Central Wetlands Regulatory Authority have been replaced by National Wetland Committee with the Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change Secretary leading it The new rules categorically forbid activities such as encroachment industrial establishment waste disposal untreated effluent discharge in wetlands Also the new rules have introduced the concept of inventory creation under which state authorities are required to compile list of all wetlands and those that need notification within a stipulated time frame these list serve as the basis for creation of a comprehensive digital inventory of all wetlands updated every decade having such broad based provisions the new rules also has certain shortcomings the first one is inadequate definition the new rules do not encompass river channels paddy fields and man made water bodies or tanks created for specific purposes such as drinking water aquaculture salt production recreation irrigation thus excluding 65% of the country's wetlands the other shortcoming is lack of uniformity the wetlands are defined and included by individual states or territories potentially leading to inconsistencies in the identification and conservation of wetlands nationwide also absence of legal provisions as the 2017 rules do not include provisions for appealing to national green tribunal nor 
do they specify a timeline for addressing the dumping of solid waste and untreated waste into the wetlands also there is an issue with the non compliance with supreme court ruling as these rules do not align with supreme court's decision in the, in the jagpal singh versus state of punjab 2011 case regarding the restoration and encroached wetlands across india lastly let us see another important effort made by the government for the conservation of wetlands in india this is center for wetland conservation and management the center was inaugurated on world wetland day in 2021 and it is an integral component of national center for sustainable coastal management that is situated in chennai and it is under the purview of ministry of environment forest and climate change the primary objective of this center is dedicated to the management restoration and conservation of india's wetlands and it aims to address knowledge gaps and specific research needs in this field the center will also facilitate knowledge exchange among state and union territory wetland authorities wetland users managers academics policy makers etc it will also foster alliances and networks with relevant regional national and international organizations and will promote integrated approaches for the protection management and sustainable utilization of wetlands the center will also assist governments at various levels in the development and implementation of legislative and policy frameworks management planning monitoring and focused wetlands conservation research before ending the discussion on this topic let us see the answer for this pyqs the first question is if rain forest and tropical forest are lungs of the earth then surely wetlands function as its kidneys here four options are given and among these option d is the correct answer as aquatic plants in the wetlands absorb heavy metals and excessive nutrients thus reflecting best the statement given in the question for question number 2 that is three statements are given here you have to select the correct statement the first statement is incorrect the second statement again is incorrect the third statement given is only correct thus option c becomes the correct answer with this we will be ending the discussion on this topic the second topic of today's session is important from general studies paper 2 perspective interstate relations tribunals dispute redressal mechanisms recently the kaveri water regulation committee has directed karnataka to continue with the release of 5000 cubic feet per second to tamil nadu for another spell of 15 days the first 15 days spell of water release was fixed by kaveri water management authority which has come to an end the central government in exercise of the powers conferred by section of interstate water disputes act 1956 had constituted the kaveri water disputes tribunal to adjudicate upon water disputes regarding interstate river kaveri and the river valley among the states of karnataka tamil nadu and Union Territory of Puducherry. The topic is important as in Maine's previous year, question appeared on the similar lines. The constitutional mechanisms to resolve the interstate water disputes have failed to address and solve the problems. Is the failure due to structural or process inadequacy or both? Discuss. Before discussing the constitutional provisions related to interstate water disputes, let us first see some of the facts related to Kaveri River. The river has a total length of around 802 kilometers and a catchment area that lies in the state of Kerala, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. The Kaveri River is known as Ganga of the South and rises in Tala Kaveri in Brahmagiri range of hills of the Western Ghats in the state of Karnataka. The important tributaries of Kaveri River are the right bank tributaries consist of kabani swarnabhati bhavani and amravati the left bank tributaries consist of harangi hemvati shimsha and arkavati moving on let us see some of the constitutional provisions related to interstate water disputes 
part 11 of the constitution under the title relations between union and states provides for disputes relating to waters under article 262 adjudication of disputes relating to waters of interstate river or river valleys has been given the article mentions that the parliament can provide for adjudication of any dispute or complaint with respect to use distribution and control of waters or any interstate river or river valley as per article 262 the parliament can also provide that neither the supreme court or any other court shall exercise jurisdiction in respect of any dispute or complaint the next provision is given in seventh schedule under list one entry 56 regulation and development of interstate rivers and the river valleys is given and entry 17 of list 2 mentions about water supplies irrigation canals drainage embankments water storage and the water power the regulation and development of interstate rivers and river valleys to the extent to which regulation and development under the control of union is declared by parliament by law that is related to public interest also in accordance with the power conferred under article 262 the parliament has enacted interstate river disputes act of 1956 here we will be discussing some of the important features related to the act the first one is related to filing of the dispute the state government which has a water dispute with another state government can request central government to refer the dispute to a tribunal for adjudication next is scope of negotiation the central government if opines that the dispute cannot be settled by negotiation then the dispute can be referred to the tribunal let us see the tribunal and its composition as provided in the provisions of the act the tribunal consists of a chairman and two other members nominated by chief justice of india from among the persons who are at the time of such nomination are judges of supreme court or high court the central government in consultation with the tribunal can also appoint assessors to advise it in the proceedings before it the tribunal is empowered to investigate the matter and make its report embodying its decision the decision is to be published by central government and it is final and binding on both the parties as per the provisions of 1956 act there has been bar on courts that is supreme courts or any other court in respect of dispute referred to the tribunal also the central government is empowered to frame a scheme providing for all the matters necessary to give effect to decision of the tribunal it can also provide for establishing an authority for implementing the scheme the central government dissolves the tribunal after it has forwarded its report and the central government is satisfied that no further reference to the tribunal would be necessary lastly let us also look at the river boards act of 1956 the act provides for establishment of river boards for the regulation and development of interstate rivers and river valleys the central government is empowered to establish a board for advising the government of the state when a request is received from a state or otherwise the established river board deals in relation to matters concerning the regulation or development of interstate river or river valleys there can be different boards for different interstate river or river valleys the board will consist of chairman and at such members as the central government decides and the appointed member will have special knowledge and experience in irrigation electrical engineering flood control navigation water conservation etc the functions of the board include conservation of water resources of the interstate river scheme for irrigation drainage development of hydroelectric power schemes for flood control promotion of navigation control of soil erosion and prevention of pollution however all the functions of the board are advisory and not educatory regarding the formulation of a scheme the board is empowered 
to frame schemes, obtain comments from the interested governments and finalize a scheme. And these schemes are not at all mandatory to implement and they are of an advisory nature. The central government can assist the state governments interested in taking such steps as may be necessary for execution of the scheme framed by the river boards. Also, the River Boards Act of 1956 has provided for arbitration in the listed matters where any dispute or difference arises between two or more government interested. With this, we will be concluding the discussion on second topic. The last topic of today's session is important from General Studies Paper 3 perspective, Science and Technology, making part of Health section. Recently, deaths due to Nipah virus have been reported in the Kozikori district of Kerala. The topic is important as in 2017, question appeared on Zika virus disease. The answer for this question will be discussed at the end of the discussion of this topic. So what is Nipah virus? Nipah virus was first identified in the year 1998 during an outbreak in Malaysia. It is a zoonotic disease that can be transmitted to humans through direct contact with infected animals, especially bats and pigs. Nipah virus infection can also be transmitted through food or direct contact from person to person. The fruit bats, which are also known as flying foxes, are believed to be the natural reservoir or primary carriers of the Nipah virus. The symptoms of Nipah virus disease include fever, muscle pain, respiratory problems which are similar to that of influenza inflammation of brain as well as late onset of encephalitis can also occur and the rate of fatality is between 65 to 100 percent at present nipah virus is on the top 10 priority list of pathogens identified by world health organization and currently there are no approved vaccines available against the nipah virus Lastly, now let us see the answer for this question. The first statement is, in tropical regions, Zika virus disease is transmitted by same mosquito that transmits dengue. The statement is correct as Zika virus disease is transmitted by the same mosquito that is Aedes species mosquito that transmits dengue. This particular species of mosquito is also responsible for spreading chikungunya disease. The second statement is sexual transmission of Zika virus disease is possible. The statement is correct as Zika is transmitted through mosquito bites but can also occur through intrauterine infection. The sexual transmission of Zika virus disease is possible even if the infected person does not have any symptoms at the time. The Zika virus disease was first identified in, in Zika forest in Uganda. Also, there is no specific treatment or vaccine currently available to treat Zika virus. From the above discussion, option C clearly becomes the correct answer. And with this, we will be concluding today's session.